There are passages in the canon that say that when the conditions for the practice are in place, then it doesn't require an act of will progress from one stage to the next. To abandon unskillful behavior, to get the mind into concentration, to gain discernment, to develop release. All these things follow naturally from the initial conditions. The problem is those initial conditions, because those are things that really do require an act of will. They don't happen on their own. The two primary ones that the Buddha mentions. One is friendship with admirable people. In other words, the people you take as your examples, the people you want to imitate. And you want to spend time with those people, listen to their drama. But not just listen, listen to the drama in their behavior. Be around them, pick up their values, pick up their attitudes. This means, of course, that when you're away from the monastery, meditating on your own, you have to create a, an atmosphere in which you are surrounded by the values of the, the noble ones. This is why we have Dharma books and Dharma talks recorded, to keep you in touch with their values, because otherwise the values of the world pull you in all sorts of other directions. So if you're thinking about practicing at home and setting up the conditions, this is the first thing. Make sure you read plenty of Dharma, listen to the Dharma talks, and develop not only friendship outside, but friendship inside. This is the second quality. It's called appropriate attention, looking at your life with the purpose of putting an end to suffering. And remind yourself that this is the most important issue in life. and not letting the mind get waylaid by other issues, because there are so many other things we know in life. And the overload of information gets heavier and heavier all the time. But it is an overload. And there's a lot of knowledge out there that, from the Buddhist point of view, it counts as ignorance. In other words, it's not related to the issue of putting an end to suffering at all. It pulls you off in all sorts of other directions. So you have to look at your own views your own understanding of what's important and how to look at yourself, asking those questions. Where is the suffering here? What's causing it? How can it be put to an end? And when you recognize the suffering, realize that there's a duty to be done. In other words, you try to comprehend it. This is not our normal reaction to suffering. Our normal reaction is to run or run away or push it away. But by running away and pushing away, you don't understand it, and it keeps coming back. It's like it's on an elastic. The more you push it away, the more it snaps back at you. You run away, and it drags behind you. So you have to turn around and look at it. Where is the connection? What's the elastic that's tying you to this? And when you see what the cause is, again, then you can let that go. The image they give in the canon is of a fire burning. In those days, they believe that fire was clinging to its fuel, and because it clung, it was stuck. Notice that the being stuck doesn't come from the fuel, it comes from the fire. In the same way, our minds are stuck on things because we cling to them. It's not that the things themselves have an adhesive, our mind has an adhesive. We learn how to peel that away, and then the suffering ends. And we do that by developing the qualities of the path virtue, concentration, discernment. You read about the precepts and ask yourself, to what extent does your behavior fit in with the precepts, and to what extent does it not? If it's not, okay, there's work to be done, particularly with the precept on speech. The Buddha points out four kinds of wrong speech. There's lying, divisive speech, in other words, you say things to split people apart from each other, or to prevent friendships from happening if you think that a friendship among two other people might be threatening to you. Harsh speech, in other words, speech that's simply meant to hurt other people's feelings. 
and then idle chatter, speech that doesn't have any real purpose at all. You want to make sure you're very strict with yourself on these things. In the beginning, it may feel confining, especially when you deal with the issue of humor, because so much of our humor is involved in exaggeration. We have to look in fantasy. They have to learn how to figure out other ways of seeing the humor in life and expressing that. And by raising the bar, your humor gets better. And the humor of truth is much more memorable than just fantasy or exaggeration. Concentration and discernment then will be much easier to attain as your precepts get better. But notice that these two qualities, friendship with admirable people and developing appropriate attention, they really do require an act of determination. You have to be very, very selective in the friends you choose, the things you choose to read, the things you choose to listen to. and the thoughts in your own mind that you choose to listen to as well. This requires determination. Underlying all of this, of course, is goodwill, and that, the Buddha specifically says, is a form of determination. This goes against what you ordinarily hear in a lot of modern Buddhist circles, that our true nature is compassionate, our true nature is one of loving-kindness. The Buddha says, no, goodwill is a determination. You have to set your mind on it. We all want happiness in one way or another. But genuine goodwill is when you realize that you want a happiness that's secure, a happiness that's blameless, a happiness that's long-term. And for it to be long-term, you have to be sensitive to the needs or the desire of other people to be happy, too. In other words, you can't make your happiness depend on their suffering. And this is an attitude that you have to consciously develop. You have to be determined to stick with this attitude. If you really wish for your own true well-being, then you'll be more likely to seek out admirable friends and be more likely to apply the standards of appropriate attention to your experience. This is a question you want to ask yourself as you choose your various actions and as you shape your life as you go through the day. Do you really wish for true happiness, or is, are you willing to settle for something less? Remember the example of the Buddha and all the noble ones. They set their sights high, and as a result they received a high level of happiness. As they say, you never hit higher than you aim. So aim high. And be aware of any friends or anything you hear, or any thoughts in your own mind that would get you to aim lower. If you stick with this determination to have genuine goodwill for yourself, genuine goodwill for those around you, and use that to underlie the principles of admirable friendship and appropriate attention. then your practice will develop naturally.